Hello and welcome to this episode of the Mary Jess Meets podcast. Today I'm going to be chatting to explorer, researcher and world record setter and breaker Rosie Stancer. So to tell you a little bit more about Rosie before we dive into the podcast, she was part of the first all women teams to reach both the North and the South Pole. She then went on to solo to both the North and the South Poles. Now, let me read this to you. So in 2003, she embarked on the Snickers South Pole solo, where she embarked alone on a solo expedition of a thousand kilometers with no resupplies and a sledge of 120 kilos to the South Pole. She smashed all the previous speed records, reaching the pole in 43 days. The fast previously was 64 days. Then in 2007, she embarked on the Mars North Pole solo, a record-breaking expedition which has never before nor since been bettered. Rosie skied, climbed and swam across the frozen Arctic Ocean alone for 84 days, setting another world record as the longest and furthest solo expedition to the North Pole by any woman. And only three days into that expedition, she had to self amputate a few of her toes. Oh, so she has so many incredible stories to tell. Those are just a handful of some of the incredible expeditions that she has embarked on. She is one of the most incredible and inspiring women that I have ever met. And I am so honored to have Rosie Stancer here. And so let's meet on the Mary Jess Meets podcast, Rosie Stancer. Hello, Rosie Stancer. Thank you so much for coming and joining me on the Mary Jess Meets podcast. I'm delighted to be here joining you. Thank you, Mary Jess. <laughs> and I'm delighted that you're here. I am so excited that I get to talk to you about all the incredible things that you have done. And it's so difficult to know where to start. So I think what we're going to do is start from the very beginning. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to ask you about how you got into your first expedition? It was really all about um, seizing an opportunity because people always wonder how on earth do you get into polar exploration? How do you become an explorer? Well, you have to start at the very beginning <laughs> and you have to have your antennae up in life for opportunities. And um, I heard over the radio about this selection process, which had attracted a bit of attention because it was for the first ever all women expedition to the North Pole. I mean, this was back in the early 90s. So very few people were actually going to the North Pole. Um, certainly no women were, were pulling sledges around either poles and something just lit up. When I heard this interview, all I can say, it was like a lit match being thrown on paraffin. I ignited. I, without any logic or rationale, knew that it was terribly important um, that I put myself in for this. And I felt um, supremely confident, which is not like me. I'm normally a timid, really moosey. Um, but I knew I was going to get there. God damn it. And... I knew it was going to lead on to greater things. So a year later, and after a selection of over 300 women, I actually got onto the team. Wow, 300 women. What was the selection process like? Were there interviews or fitness tests? Yes, 300 other nutters. Um, <laughs> it was a whole year in the process because we all had to be put through our paces um, all together as well, because um, they weren't just looking for uh, brute strength um, or skills that had already been honed in the field from, you know, expeditions or camping. Um, I mean, Lord knows, I didn't even know which way to hold up a compass. <laughs> I didn't know the difference between a tent peg and a clothes peg. Um, they were more looking for uh, s strength, inner strength, resilience, you know, flexibility, and teammanship, above all, I think, teammanship. And the year 
accumulated in a, a four day selection process um, on Dartmoor and three nights, not that any of us saw any sleep because it was, it was manned by the special forces who <clears throat> applied um, sleep deprivation whilst putting us through our paces on courage. So yes, we had to do scary things and on physical endurance, um, resourcefulness, and you know, you were told to maybe do some night navigation and as I said, didn't know how to hold a compass up the right way. Well, they wanted to watch how you dealt with that, how you coped. And if you metaphorically speaking fell six, seven, eight times, could you get up nine times? So I found the whole process very interesting actually. And um, I think one of the most interesting things was that right at the beginning of that four day selection process, very early on, uh, those of us who were going to be selected, I think we all knew who we were. It was an instinct because we knew we were going to be placing our lives in one another's hands. <laughs> Gosh, that sounds incredibly tough, what they put you through. What were those scary things that they made you do? Um, Abseiling over um, a 90 foot cliff in the dark. <laughs> uh, I remember there was that. Personally, I found the most frightening thing was being told on the fourth day, extremely hard to put together an Ikea cupboard in under whatever time limit it was. <laughs> <laughs> but there was things like, um, swimming across um, a town, uh, you know, like a small lake of extremely cold water with your extremely heavy rucksack and in all your kit. And you, you still were carrying around a telegraph pole with some other girls and you had to get from one side to the other and continue on. So it was a lot about grit, getting through that, but also wit as well as grit, if you want, and, and knowing, um, well, okay, how am I going to get my rucksack over this deep town? How am I going to dry when I get to the other side? All those sort of things, which were actually extremely applicable in polar exploration. Yeah, and you talk about that instinct of knowing the people that you were going to be spending that time with. What do you think the qualities of, and personalities of those people were like? Were there things that you all had in common or were they things that really surprised you? Really surprised me and um, in some ways humbled me because whilst one might be strong in one area, um, you have to learn to be tolerant of other people's weaknesses in the same area because in a completely different area where you are weak, they will be immensely strong. And, and I think that's what good te team dynamics is, is all about. Not, not to judge, but to respect the other person's skills. Mm. How many people were out on that first expedition with you? How many women were there? <laughs> 20. 20. 20 amateur women. The, the, the real heroines uh, were um, as ever unsung. There were two female guides. One was Canadian and one American and um, our Cumbrian ice trainer as well, although he didn't join the expedition. Jeff Summers, shout out. <laughs> and um, we were 20 bumbling amateurs. I mean, yes, we, we were trained specifically to be able to carry out the task. We were trained not just physically, but in survival and, and ice skills, navigation, et cetera, et cetera. But, but uh, really it was a triumph over logistics and hormones. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So I guess you had a lot of different strengths and weaknesses within this group. And there was, I guess, a lot of people to get you through the times. Did you find that you were all part of the same big group or did you feel like you all sort of branched off into little smaller groups for various things? Well, we had to branch into small groups because the whole uh, structure of the expedition, you, you couldn't possibly take 20 people on, onto the uh, North Pole, the Arctic ice cap together. It's far too dangerous. Um, and uh, none of us could afford either the sponsorship or the time. We were all working women, most of us were. Um, and so 
we split it into a relay. Um, and this afforded us time, but also attracted a lot more sort of uh, attention. So it helped us get the sponsorship because this was really British eccentricity at its epitome. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, we had we had teams of four who who relayed, and it was because it was uh, structured as a relay that by the end of my stint, I was still chomping at the bit. I did not want to be taken off off the ice. I thought they're going to have to come down and strawberry net me. I don't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> How long was your bit? How long did your part of the relay take? God, I can't remember now. I think it was about twenty days, so not very long. Wow. So after 20 days, you still wanted to stay out and carry on the rest of the expedition? Yes. Most definitely. Some women wanted to hang up their boots, tick to that box. And then there was a hardcore of us, well, six of us actually, who uh, almost immediately got together to plan the next one. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing that you felt like that. Before we go on to the next one, I just want to ask you more about the women that were involved in this, because we've just had International Women's Day. Were yes. there a lot of different demographics that were represented, a lot of different age groups? Yes. What were the women like that you were doing this with? Totally different ages, shapes, size, creeds, colours, um, and um, each had their strength, I think. And... Um, there was, for instance, a mother and daughter. Uh, there was a woman who had had triplets. Wow. Uh, a film financier. There was a farmer. There was a, I mean, you name it. It was, it was the Pied Piper of Hamlin. <laughs> That's incredible. What a wonderful way to celebrate women of all colours, shapes, sizes and backgrounds. That's absolutely yes. incredible. But absolutely. I just find it amazing that it was, a radio advert that was sent out and it's just luck as to who heard it. Well, no, the, to tell the truth, before I earwigged the radio commercial, uh, there was the traditional uh, method used, which was placing an advertisement in the Times, asking if anyone was interested in joining this all women's first ever rah rah team to the North Pole safe safe return not guaranteed. <laughs> <sighs> That's absolutely amazing, and I love that you said you took that opportunity because I know that a lot of people who have listened to my podcast before will be aware of my second motto that I was brought up with, which was to make the most of every single opportunity available to you always and that's something that my mum taught me from a very very young age so I love the fact that you dived straight in with that saying I took an opportunity and I love that you did that but what were you doing before what was your job before you became an explorer and had this opportunity I was very happily immersed in the fluffy pink world of of hotel public relations <laughs> Sipping wow. champagne, entertaining journalists, organising film shoots. <laughs> quite, quite happy for uh, the Park Lane Hotel on, um, in Mayfair on Piccadilly. Gosh, that's so, was, so different. Well, it, it was so different. But as you were saying and your, your motto, because you're a plucky lass, <laughs> um, because it's all very well being aware of opportunities, but most people turn around and keep on walking past them because actually moving on that opportunity that's that's as they say the first step in any journey and therefore it is the most frightening because you're stepping over this crevasse of what you know what is safe and familiar into the unknown absolutely you're completely right although I shouldn't imagine um <laughs> going out onto the ice was was not scary I imagine that was an also scary part of the process <laughs> being out there for so long but it's great that you had that community of women around you I'm just so intrigued by the fact that it sparked your attention so much when you'd been in such a different world you said you didn't know the difference between a clothes peg and a tent peg and you know how to hold a compass it's such a huge difference so what do you think really sparked your interest about it how come this was an opportunity out of all the opportunities that are available into the world where you went this one is for me even though it's so different um it's very deep because um clearly the the sense of adventure held 
huge appeal to me. But I think there were layers beneath that, which I didn't actually even initially uh, consciously at the front of my mind uh, recognize. Um, I became more aware of it um, as I put the ice smiles under my belt, so to speak. And there was this um, recognition and tug towards something that I knew was terribly important. There was some, there was a reason to do it. There was a legacy to be carved from it. Um, it wasn't just all about um, bagging firsts and being a, a glory merchant. What were and, those other things? Well, th this sort of, uh, this question that any, polar explorer I know has always been asked and always struggled to answer about why, why do you put yourself through such hell? <laughs> um, and I think that the, the reasons evolve um, the more you do it because you realize the importance of exploration, whether it's polar or any other kind of exploration. It's, it's actually not just about the physical um, heroics or the physical journey. It's, it's a triple tier journey. It's, it's physical, psychological and, and deeply spiritual as well. So you're exploring um, not just the planet, but you're exploring beyond the boundaries of human potential. Well, that's certainly what you've done. And I know that you've done a lot of research on your expeditions as well. And so is that one of the reasons why you find it, why you feel that it is so important? Or is it also because you're really setting an amazing example of, of what women can be capable of? Is it also that that's important to you? That too has become important because I wasn't really aware of it until when you, when you speak to people um, publicly, um, you, you see a light in their eyes. And I think that, and, and you can see that they see all things are possible if you start off by seizing that opportunity and take the first step and so on and so forth. But that because I, I don't look like a, a superwoman, right? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not tall, hairy with a beard and, you know, I, I don't have the iconic pillar for a thank God. But in, <laughs> um, I'm actually, for those watching who also don't know me, I am actually on the petite side. <laughs> more of a powder puff in other words people recognize that you don't have to look the part that I'm completely unexceptional and therefore if I can put my mind to something like that so too can they to whatever their end aspirations are Absolutely. I love what you said there, because there's so many people uh, from my point of expertise in the music industry, where they said, I didn't think I could be a singer because I don't look like what I thought a professional singer should look like. Yeah. But that doesn't matter. As long as you feel that you can do this and you know in your heart that that's what you want to do. What other people think you look like or think you can achieve based on what you look like shouldn't matter. Didn't matter. You're so right, Mary, just because actually how you feel inside transcends how you look. That's what beauty is all about. I love that you said that. You're completely right. And I do um I do know that we're about the same height, aren't we? We're five foot three. <laughs> yeah, we're five foot three. We're both rather petite. Um, I think you're probably even smaller than me, even with all your incredible chiseled muscles that you've got going on with all your training that you do. <laughs> so yeah, it's just absolutely amazing to see just what you are able to achieve and accomplish when you know in your heart that you can do it. And I love that you're an amazing example of that. So. Following on from your first expedition and following on from that, what I think is an incredible lesson um, and incredible inspiration, to be honest, I want to go on to talk about your second trip. So you said that six women did not want to hang up their boots. They wanted to carry on. They'd got the bug. Were those six women all with you when you did your second one? Uh, no. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> sadly, they weren't. In fact, six of us all together, but one of them had a a uh, cycling accident and uh, was was injured broke around quite badly and couldn't couldn't join us oh no so that was a huge shame because I was very fond of her Jan McCormack and um so it ended up um with just the uh 
Sorry, um, um, me. yeah, five of us, yeah. And uh, we thought, okay, uh, what goes up must come down. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll go south. And um, so we decided to go to the uh, South Pole. We're, we're talking geographic poles here, by the way, not magnetic. Um, so from the top of the world to the bottom of the world, only this time we wouldn't take guides. Um, and uh, it's, it was, it's about a thousand click to the South Pole, as I remember. So we would have uh, one resupply and, um, and off, off we went. And um, indeed, uh, it, yeah, indeed, we were the first British women to all women team to get there. <laughs> That's incredible. It's completely incredible. There's so many things I want to ask you about this, but I'm going to start off with you said about having one resupply. I should imagine it's such a vast area. How do they find you? And what are the resupplies that you get? Well, um, you know where you are because of when you're navigating, you, you have to track your position. So you've got to be able to give the pilots your coordinates as to where you are. And I mean, you, you have to do a kind of, it's not unfortunate phrasing, um, crash course in aviation because um, these pilots are risking their lives to, to fly in little twin otter, little twin engine propeller planes um, to uh, drop you resupplies or to pick you up, whatever it is. And um, the conditions uh, are very fast moving. Um, you go through several weather patterns every day on Antarctica. And of course, as everybody knows, the winds are screaming ferocious and uh, visibility can be appalling. So you have to know what conditions to give them, uh, what would be realistic to um, understand that they can land in, um, how long a, an airstrip they require, how wide, which direction it must go in, how to market and how to kind of you have a huge sort of Kenny ever you know um, iridium satellite phones in those days how to sort of nurse them in as it were <laughs> they normally ignore you and go on their you know, fly by the seat of their pants <laughs> um, so uh, they are real heroes those pilots they're like characters out of those little commando books one's brother used to get they're very gung-ho. I remember seeing when they were refueling uh, on our way back from having reached the pole at a fuel cache in, in the ice, buried in the ice cap. They had to dig out the oil drums and then fuel the pit. Doing so, they had lit cigarettes hanging out of them. <laughs> That's the way it is there. Oh my gosh. So they yeah. actually have fuel tanks buried in the ice so they know where they are and how to get to them? Yes. But with the winds in Antarctica, are they often under meters of snow and ice? How do they? Well, they, they do pick their places quite carefully mm. and uh, with logic and they mark them. And then obviously they get a way mark, which on their navigation system. So if everything is covered in, in um, ice cap movement or blizzards or ground storm or whatever, they, they still know where it is. And if it's buried, you just have to dig to get to it. I mean, there are, there's a whole aeroplane buried there which crashed which I skied past um on my solo with it just its tail wing sticking out oh my and gosh the, the mountain range is buried under the ice cap it's so vast and deep and the mountain ranges you can just see these little tops sticking out tiny small little mountainettes which are called nanotooks um so it's well 10,000 feet deep the ice cap at the pole gosh that's incredibly interesting the pilot of the clash, crashed plane, did they survive? What's that story? Do you know? I think most of them did, not all of them. Um, and uh, so uh, it won't, won't have been the only one on, on Antarctica, sadly. Goodness me. Well, these pilots, they do sound incredibly brave. <laughs> um, having lit cigarettes around fuel, for example, <laughs> being one example. Yes, Goodness me. Brave. When they do pick you up at the end, whatever it is, you, <laughs> you haven't had a shower for a couple of months. And, you <laughs> and then they put you in a snug twin otter plane. <laughs> and it ends up smelling like a game larder. <laughs> Goodness me. 
So with all that aviation knowledge that you've had to learn, have you also had flying lessons? Uh, no. I was allowed to take the controls on one of my solo things, but I can't say that that, that does not mean that I, I know how to fly. But Gosh. I know what a pilot needs. That's amazing. Did you enjoy your flying experience when you took the controls? Do you think it's something you might want to do? Um, no, I did enjoy it, but I don't know. I don't think it didn't, you know, light me up particularly. OK, fair enough, because you've got all that base knowledge there. It seemed like something that you could easily transition onto. Um, and it's something that I'm sure some of my supporters will know that I absolutely love. <laughs> so, yeah, um, for two of my birthdays now, I've been bought a flight in a light aircraft. So the first one was a Cessna 152, the second was a Robin. Um, yeah. And I just, I loved it. The pilot, she said, I don't think I've quite had anybody quite as excited as you next to me in the plane before. <laughs> I'm not sure I like the sounds of a Robin. It's not like the old Robin Reliant cars. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, well, it's not quite, but it felt just as rickety, to be honest. It was a bit of a... <laughs> well, I tell you what, we could team up here because you could become my pilot. In a twin <laughs> Care, so honestly Rosie careful what you suggest here because I am one of those women who will take an opportunity when you <laughs> you'd be so glamorous you would be like the female pilot in James Bond wasn't it pussy galore <laughs> oh gosh that honestly if I could be one of those if, like, female, female pilot in James Bond if that's got to go on the bucket list now that is it <laughs> that's got to be on the list Bye. Aim high, why not? Exactly. Well, you might as well aim high with things. I think you're an amazing example of that. You aim to be the first no. woman to solo to both poles and then here you are, you've done it. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Oh my gosh. Right, sorry, back on track. We're gonna be talking about the resupplies that come in um, because I'm really intrigued as to what the supplies are that you take with you and what you need to be resupplied. I guess it's things like food. Uh, food fuel and uh, medicine um, and anything else by way of sort of equipment and things like that for the most part you 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 have to sort of just modify and get on with what you've got and if you break it you've got to fix it um, because there probably isn't anywhere unless you bought them with you at base camp um, to replace broken uh, equipment um, but it shouldn't and you shouldn't break your equipment it must be so difficult to know what to pack because you've got to drag this all the way. I think I remember you telling me before that you were even cutting off some of the plastic on your toothbrush so that you didn't have that weight to go along with you. <laughs> Polar apocryphal story that, but it is true, you do. I mean, you everything has got to be super, super light um, because um, every gram counts and you strip the linings out of clothes or tents, you cut off labels, you, yes, you cut your toothbrush, the, the handle and maybe trim the bristles. Um, you don't take things like um, uh, loo paper or things like that. You use what you've got in terms of nature as, as much as possible. And, and when it comes to um, food, uh, you've got to get dense amount of of energy i.e calories into a lighter load as possible so it's all reasonably scientifically based worked out balanced um carbs protein fat um and and of course your, your fuel as well is vital because you uh, rely on it to primarily melt the ice to make the water to drink. You drink an awful, awful lot of water in the cold because you dehydrate through your mouth and you dehydrate through sheer exertion. It's, it's damn hard work. And actually, <laughs> believe it or not, you get very hot. Um, you don't generally use fuel for warmth in the tent. That's not the point. It's nice, wonderful to have warmth while you're melting the snow. Um, but um, it's it's not for luxurious use like that. Goodness me. Yeah. Sorry, it's very heavy. Yeah, it's too heavy. Yeah. Wow. 
That's so interesting. And I remember you showing us in your expedition hut. I mean, it's so cool that you've got a whole shed for your expeditions. That's we're gonna we're gonna have to talk more about that in a minute. But <laughs> the food, you had these packets of food, and they honestly look like things that would be taken up in a rocket to the International Space Station. Yeah, well, they are. <laughs> Uh, and that was the nice of it. That was the, shall we say, dinner, the evening meal, <laughs> um, which was dehydrated. And you, again, you, you, you melt ice and you add the water, but you, you also probably add a bit of butter and stuff like that, butter and everything, the fat. Um, and otherwise, uh, otherwise, the marching rations during the day, you, you have to um, nose bag, as it were, every one and a half to two hours, because you're using so much energy all the time you're probably burning about 9,000 calories a day. Um, so you can't possibly stay on top of that deficit, but you you therefore have to eat and drink little handfuls every okay. other hour at least. And so in one uh, nose bag, as I used to call, um, you'll have all together jumbled up a mixture of relatively carefully selected nuts, um, sliced everything sliced and and unwrapped obviously beforehand mars bars bis a biscuit perhaps uh, some hard cheese neat butter and salami that's just about it these days um your younger expeditioners uh, take much more scientifically formulated energy bar a couple of energy bars and a box of vitamin pills uh, but frank but frankly i think that you're fueling not just your body but your motivation as well and sometimes it gets so important the little things to keep you going on really tough days it's like you're playing mind games about what well, shall i treat myself to a sort of brazil nut in the next break rather than an almond this that the other it's very important it helps keep you going the variety no nope, but that's me maybe i'm just greedy <laughs> No, that was actually a question I was going to ask you is, is what keeps you going like that? There's the, it just must be, I can't even imagine how tough it would be, especially when you're on your own and you're doing these solo missions. Just what are the things that keep you going? And I, like, I'm sure a Brazil nut has got something to do with it, but that can't be everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, not reliant on a Brazil nut, um, but you're right. The, that on your own, I don't know, sometimes I find it easier maybe because you can uh, invest all, all your mental energy into yourself um, and uh, you cannot let yourself um, give up. So whatever mind game it takes or distraction that it takes and also an innate sense of positivity and, and a sort of, maybe I'm just a fool's optimist, but no matter how hideous the day has been the next morning I will always wake up full of optimism thinking today's got to be better surely <laughs> no, it wasn't but you know that's that's uh, how I used to think and and just to to keep going and sometimes particularly in the north where you're uh, confronted with um, these huge walls of ice rubble which are about 50 feet high and terribly difficult to get over with a heavy sledge on your own and they move and they make terrifying noises and you climb all the way up one sometimes you have to relay your kit or build platforms with your spade and you get up to the top and what do you see hundreds of miles to the horizon of more of the same stuff wall after wall after so what do you do you just think don't focus on the horizon, you focus on each wall as it comes. And every time you get over the wall, it's a triumph, one in the back, you know, and just keep going. <laughs> really, you have to be very thick, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think courageous, definitely courageous. But that's such an amazing lesson for so many things. 
is just like how do you eat a tree you take it one leaf at a time when you've got this massive task in front of you and you're able to break it down into those little wins that is something that really keeps your motivation going I mean I, I don't think I've ever had to face anything like those walls you're talking about but it's a lesson that is easily transferable to many different things isn't it it is in many walks of life and uh whether it's sort of getting through a lockdown or whether it was i was talking to an ex um prison inmate yesterday and it's about the apparent enormity of the length of a sentence but you mustn't look at the whole picture you to divide it up into sections and the whole thing becomes mentally manageable in in, in sort of time clips as it were yeah can you tell me more about scaling those walls because your sledge I've seen pictures of it. It looks huge. Like, how heavy is that? Oh, yeah, Priscilla, Queen of Drag. Uh, <laughs> I actually, on the, on the north, um, for two thirds of that expedition, I had two sledges. I had Priscilla and I had Bubba, who was a baby sledge, because I thought, uh, you know, that the weight that I had to pull, which was less than, south pole because when i did the south pole unsupported it was a uh, 120 kilos but the north pole is so much more uh rugged and rabbly and full of obstacles like open water and sometimes you have to move terribly quickly um if it's getting dangerous and the ice is moving so i had two sledges to divide the weight and i could always relay them but sometimes getting over the ridges you didn't just have to relay your sledges you had to relay the kit inside them because they were so steep but um I had a spade as I mentioned and I sometimes used to just you try and sort of visualize a, a, a possible path up these walls and then you'd just get digging making little platforms so that you could stand and pull up a sledge park it get a, go up build another ledge um and then just push them over, over the edge and there was a lot of um a lot of shouting shouting out loud that really helped really helped <laughs> seriously <laughs> and, um I don't know how, what you'd make of this as a, as a singer but I did have uh I did have another voice which was probably the alter ego which was very encouraging and it was very uh, authoritative, very deep, very bossy. Go, come on, keep heading north, get that sledge up. It was, I used to call it the field marshal. And um, actually, the, we'll talk about it later, no doubt, but the field marshal actually came to my rescue in narrow squeaks on several occasions. So make of this other voice what you will, um, whether psychiatrists would have a field day or just think well it's a natural reaction in an extreme environment or whether it was something else I don't know it doesn't matter because it worked for me <laughs> that's amazing I think that's so interesting to have the field marshal there it's like your inner voice just edging you on saying you can do this it's like that inner confidence that you've got that inner flame inside you that just says no matter what happens to you you can carry on and I think that's an amazing asset to have something like that yes I think it is and I think we all have it that that lovely saying um by Bhagavati about quiet in the mind and hear the soul speak um in my instance the soul was rather a bossy one but there we go <laughs> gosh uh, that's so interesting sorry carry on I yes uh well in extreme environments uh, you have to let go of all the layers of crud that you build up in this reality. Um, and you get down to um, the, the real you, the husk of you. And all your senses are on super alert. When I say all your senses, there are some senses there that seem to become dormant in this reality, that reawaken in that reality for purposes of survival so you your intuition becomes very keen for instance and um you almost feel animal like but in a sophisticated way because you could um and i could i could um anticipate 
things happening or danger, could almost smell it, uh, my body temperature would, would change. Um, all sorts of things like that start happening and to the degree that you, you dispense with any gadgetry, you, you don't need it. You, you, you go with, with um, the wind, the sun, you read the ice and you also listen, listen to the music of the ice. It, it, it tells you a lot. Gosh, the music of the ice. That sounds amazing. It sounds, what is it telling you when it plays music to you? I guess are you talking about potentially the sound of cracks or the sound of the ice moving? Yes, uh, it's, it has so many different sounds. It's the Arctic, which after all is, is not a continent like Antarctica, it is just a frozen crust of ice over the Arctic Ocean. So it's moving all the time. It's a very violent place. And if you fly up with Mary Jess, <laughs> look above the Arctic ice, what, what you'll see is like a big jigsaw puzzle, all these massive white slabs and lots of little white slabs and it's, and it's all jostling around moving it's been shunted around by the uh conspiring forces of of the winds the hurricane winds from above and then below you've got all the the sea currents so there's a massive amount of natural force we're thrusting these plates of ice together which is what creates these walls of rubble as it folds up it's like if you get a tablecloth and push it together <laughs> it'll ruckle up won't it? And then elsewhere, it's being torn asunder. So imagine the noise of all this going on. I mean, it is, it is forget O2, it is deafening. Um, Gosh. When it gets on the move, and if you're caught in um, an ice quake, which I've been caught in a huge ice quake, and it's like um, Hell's Own Orchestra striking up you've got bit at the bottom of the ice down in the sea where the ice is tearing you've got this very deep resonant bass clef which sort of vibrates through your chest and then as you move up through the layers of the ice you've got almost like a sort of polystyrene noise of the ice rubbing and then you've got the tearing sound which can be like um a cannonball um and your warning signs can be like a like when you stand in the tube and a train is coming. Um, and then above with all the boulders of ice, you've got the sound of them crashing off these walls and off the boulders as they crash down, you've got an infinite number of ice crystals. So tinkling, 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 tinkling. I, I used to say it was like a, an elderly butler holding a tray of crystal glasses with shaky hands, <laughs> but it was absolutely terrifyingly noisy when that sort of thing got going. <laughs> Gosh, I, I really wanted to ask you about ice quake as well, because that was a term that I hadn't heard until you sent the notes through for this. And I just I thought that sounded terrifying. <laughs> yes, well, it is. I, I, I don't know if it's a correct technical term, but it, it sums it up because it's normally um, rather than just the ice doing its thing and breaking and moving and whatever, it's when a huge bit of ice breaks away. And in, in the instance uh, that I first encountered it, it was some very old ice, which doesn't normally break up, didn't used to, um, does sadly these days, off the Canadian um, side and for thousands of miles. Um, it was this huge great chunk was breaking off. So, That's so sad. Goodness yeah. me. But those sounds that the ice delivers when things are happening, I guess you, you learn to know what they mean. So when you're talking about your intuition being heightened so that you're far more aware of your surroundings, do you think that's partly a woman's intuition or do you think that's also just your experience and your knowledge that you've got from doing this? I think um, man or woman, uh, I'd like to think that if, if you've got that will to survive within you, it is a necessity, it comes out. Um, you know that it's, it's what your survival um, depends on and you have to, um, you're not out there to conquer these 
environments. You couldn't possibly conquer nature. Um, therefore, you had to adapt and and go with her. I mean, you know, we all know this much banded around word these days, resilience, but but really the definition of resilience is flexibility, isn't it? When you when you look it up. <laughs> and um being rigid is being brittle. You you have to be flexible and uh go with it. And um any people I know who come croppers on, on the ice have tended to be too rigid, get there, any cost, stick to the plan, stick to the route, doesn't, doesn't work that way. Gosh, what was a good example of where you've had to be really flexible and change your plans? Oh, well, uh, on the Arctic, well, quite a lot, because um, one was supposed to be heading, of course, um, due north, with it <laughs> to the North Pole. Um, uh, but sometimes those sea currents I mentioned that are um, uh, having a pulling effect on the ice can pull you backwards so that you're using losing hard slogged <laughs> miles and if you stop so much as for a pee you're going backwards um, so or maybe the ice up ahead is uh, breaking up dangerously so you have to think right okay can't just keep heading north we've got to adjust the bearing because we're being pulled that much that way so got to do this and it's very tough mentally to keep going not in the direction that you know that you should be to get there sooner rather than later so that the, there is all that um, and there's also the um judgments the decisions that you have to make all the time which is actually extremely stressful because every decision your life could hang on it and things like, should I uh, make camp before this storm really gets up and I can't get the tent up? Or should I get the tent down and not be able to put it up again and find that I can't move in it or the ice is breaking it, da 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 da. Um, and so you have to get the measure of it very, very carefully. Normally, I think to myself, apply the Shackleton rule, survival, paramount better to be a live donkey coming back share your story than a dead lioness <laughs> so uh, me. the day that you have to getting back to the point that you lose a vital day because you're pinned down in the tent by a storm then you have to adapt your time plan because it the fallout effect is your precious rations means you have to lie there and starve probably in order to make sure you've got enough to march on you you know you're going to wake up or open up your tent in a completely different place to where you put it up because of the ice um so your plans are all completely different every day is like the start of the expedition again and the the um inuits have a wonderful saying which is worth everybody bearing in mind which is hurry up and wait <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny how do they use that saying because i've heard that in the enter entertainment industry a lot but i guess it's a different kind of thing like i've heard it in that everybody wants you to be ready now and then you're by the side of the stage and they're like no wait <laughs> and you could be waiting by the side of the stage for 15 20 minutes before you've actually got to go on <laughs> that must play havoc with your nerves <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I've got used to it now. I know that that's kind of how it works, but that's how I've heard that saying used before is in the entertainment industry. So how does it work for the Inuits? Uh, because it means you have to, to uh, you know, wait and go with nature. Um, I think I first heard it when, when I was with the other girls on our uh, second expedition to the South Pole as a small group. And uh, you have to wait for the one and only plane to fly from Chile in Punta Arenas onto an ice strip on Antarctica, uh, an old Hercules as it was then. So um, conditions, you have to wait for a sort of miracle really because the conditions have to be right for takeoff in Punta Arenas, fine. But conditions always, because when you land on Antarctica, you're landing on ice 
with a mountain one side. So there can't be strong crosswinds. There can't have been ground storm over the, anyway, lots of complicated things. Um, we ended up having a flight delay, I'll never complain at Gatwick again, three weeks hold up in Punta Arenas while we're waiting for a scramble call, three weeks. And in fact, when I went down back to Punta Arenas for my solo, I still had to wait for 10 days for the illusion as it was by then. Oh my gosh, three weeks. I guess the thing is though, is you're going to such a crazy environment. You have to wait until the conditions are just right. There must only be such a small window. Were you worried in those three weeks that you might not actually get to go? Yeah. Um, one of the things about Antarctica and the flight was that um, there were quite a few mountaineers because there's a mountain called Mount Vincent on Antarctica, which has become part of this PR branding of Seven Summits. Um, sniff of disapproval from me. Um, and so of course, a lot of the people who, who are doing their Seven Summits will do Mount Vincent last because it's so horrifyingly expensive and also probably takes up more time and um so some of them are running on a, a time budget and i do feel very sorry for them because you can turn up and wait and go home again without having ever done it oh, that would be gutting wouldn't it you spent all this time and effort preparing and yeah. try and get the money together yeah. and then you can't go because of the weather <laughs> be devastated well, it happens with polar expeditions too, of course, um, because of the ice. And uh, with the Arctic, you're in a race against time. So if, you, if your departure date is delayed beyond um, the window of time you can possibly realize your journey in, um, the pilots will not pick you up off the ice late. They can't. They, they will kill them. So you can't go at all. Um, and on the Russian side, if you can go to the North Pole from Canada or Russia, if you go from Russia, in theory, it's easier because the ice is newer, therefore it's flatter. However, uh, especially these days, the ice very rarely joins the mainland and to be legitimate in the full journey because your end aim is on sea, you have to start on land. And I remember some years ago now, a, a polar colleague flying out to Russia to do it and uh, the ice never met the land. So the Russian helicopter, because they have a helicopter pilot, offered to fly him and uh, another girl and another guy over to where the ice start. He went with the helicopter. The other guy and the girl uh, didn't and said, we'll chance it, waited, waited. And then they chanced it on thin moving ice and she, she disappeared, drowned. And he was rescued off the edge of a, a slab of ice, a frostbite sort of up to, up to his neck, not, not good. Oh, so, goodness me. Any risk that you take, and you do have to take risks, but you should weigh them up very carefully and they should be calculated risks. Gosh. Not rash. That's so scary. That is so scary. I feel like that leads us into talking about something that I wanted to ask you about earlier when you said it. You said um, being able to get up in the morning after a terrible day and have that amazing optimism to keep going with what you were doing. Um, and so I'm going to ask you now, if you're happy to share, what were the terrible days where you got up in the morning and thought, surely today is gonna to be better than yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> I think two, two days, there were two very, very different uh, days, which were my worst. And um, one was more of the sort of, Harrison Ford ripping great adventure one, which when I came to grief. And it was um, it was towards the end of my solo on the 
Arctic towards the North Pole. And um, I had been um, I had been in pain uh, for a very long time. And I think I'd been on the ice by then for over 70 days. And um, I'd had an injury that had plagued me all along, which was causing me a lot of pain, which was frostbite. And uh, I was also extremely malnourished, sleep deprived, um, and, uh, and probably a bit out of my, out of my tree on the painkillers that I've been taking. Anyway, um, I was desperate for mileage because the closer you get to the pole, the stronger that current gets and the faster the ice is shunting you. And in my instance, unhappily, it was what they call negative drift. I was being sucked to the south whilst I tried to head north, like going the wrong way on those aeroplane flat es escalator things. And I saw um, what one calls uh, a lead, which is where the ice is cracked open um, to the ocean and it is frozen again. Um, and normally you can, you, you, you know with your experience whether you can ski across it or not. You know how long it would have taken to have frozen to a certain depth in certain temperatures. Plus the fact that if it's very new ice and there is a nylas, which is a skin of black ice on top, because it's salty, that viscosity will give it strength. So it, it bends, it's rubbery ice I used to call it. It will bend underneath you, but you can shuffle over on skis if you're super careful. This big wide open lead was ahead of me. I looked across it and I saw a little telltale black line threading through the middle which meant that it was broken in the middle, which meant there wouldn't be that same viscosity. Um, and I, I don't know what got into me. I was desperate for that mileage. And I just, I just lengthened the rope, the back of my sledge and started shuffling across on my skis. And of course, as I came towards that black ribbon, the, the inevitable happened. And I heard this sort of splintering sound, cracking sound. And then I started to sink in stately fashion. And I drilled and drilled and drilled what to do in these circles. So automatic, arms akimbo, legs steady, and down you go. Um, the problem was, uh, I went down with my skis on, I was still attached to my sledge. And every time I tried to get out, of course, the ice broke underneath my hands. I, I do remember thinking as I sank down, um, looking looking around to see, right, where am I going to head to when I get out? I've got to find a safe bank. But I couldn't get out of the water. And um, suddenly, uh, the field marshal <laughs> appeared, galloped over and started bellowing away. <laughs> he said, get your skis off, girl. I thought, you must be joking. The only things above the ice were my hands on the ice, shoulders, head. I didn't want, I really didn't want to stick my hands underneath as well. It was all, anyway, I did. And I had trained um, many times in a diving pool to get my skis off underwater. And so I got them off through each one across the ice. I can hear them clattering now. And then he said, think like a seal. And I sort of visualized a seal. And of course, a seal doesn't go plonk with its flippers. It kind of throws itself out so that its weight is dispersed. So I tried more to throw myself out with shoulder weight. And I got out and I wiggled out. And I started wiggling furiously <laughs> um, towards the far bank. Oh, no, you don't. Back you go. You've got to get your skis, said the field marshal. Damn him. Because the last thing I wanted to do was because I chucked my skis over the other side of the hole. The far side. So it meant that I had to ski and wiggle back 
over the danger zone. And I remember just thinking, I can't do it. I'll just go through again. And then from afar, I could see Jock, you know, Jock, my son, um, who was then much younger. And he had painted on my skis and he had painted rainbows, caterpillars, butterflies. <laughs> and I thought, my God, I've got to get these skis. This is terribly important because I've got to go on after this and I've got to get back. I've got to get back to Jock. I've got to get back with this story. So I did wiggle back an awful long <laughs> circuit of route, but I got those skis, pushed them myself, pulled Priscilla on her long leash back up the bank. And, um, and then we, soaking wet, course wasn't out of danger turning into a human lollipop by the second so it was a question of you know I always prepared for that as well so I had I immediately got the the boots off because I was very aware of the frostbite problem that I already had um and before the boots froze around your feet but I got them off took off the wet inner socks put on dry inner socks an empty ration bag over those and then wet socks and everything else on top of them again same with the hands and then off you go with your inner layers dry, um, marching furiously to create some heat. Um, and I, I don't think I really stopped for proper breaks for the rest of that day, just eating chocolate and drinking tea and thanking the powers that be as I went for helping me through that. Um, and interestingly, when I tell that story, I look back, I think how terrifying, but it wasn't so frightening at the time and at, at the end of it all marching along squelch squelch I just thought triumph got through that survived rather than as you say waking up full of dread the net for the next day not a bit of it couldn't <laughs> couldn't be as bad again <laughs> Goodness me, that was going to be my question about um when you said you managed to get out you're still not out of danger because turning into a human lollipop as you say being in those frozen water and then having that all around your body whilst the winds are howling at you and you've got all the snow and the ice around how do you like it'd be scary to even get your bare skin out onto something like that but you must have been so cold and so wet did you change all of your clothes then you said your inner layers were dry so does that mean there was a like a waterproof layer even when you go into the water how's that work no, the only things I changed were what was wet through the feet and the, the, the hands. Um, you wear so many layers on a polar expedition, even if they're multiple thinner layers, thinner layers, and then a thicker layer and maybe a wind shell, la la la, that it didn't actually penetrate my um, up to the skin on my, the trunk, which was very important because, of course, your organs, you can't let your organs get cold. Um, but what happens in those temperatures is that um, all the blood um, in your system and your capillaries and everything will rush from the um, extensions of your body, your i.e. your hands and your toes, etc., to protect your organs. And that, that's why people get problems with their digits, as it were. Mm. Um, but you're, you're right, you've got even um, in the aftermath of that, there's no time for a, a, bat, a pat on the back. You've got to think about uh, every next move because I realized that I did not have the option of um, setting up a tent and making a hot brew, which you would if you were with a team because my hands would turn to wood before I could um, finish the task and I wouldn't be able to strike a match, light the stove type scenario and it would, totally unravel. Goodness me, and that field marshal as well, when you talk about him, you use the, the pronouns for a man. Um, it's very interesting. It's like that inner voice of survival, that incredible instinct of survival that just will not let you give up. Um, mm. What an incredible, strength to have an inner voice like that but it's very interesting that you use male pronouns yes isn't it well um <clears throat> the voice was 
I suppose it was a bit spooky. I wonder now, now that you're pressing me on the mail bit, I wonder if it sounded like a sort of medium, you know, when they a different, totally different and a deeper voice comes on. Um, but um, I think maybe you've hit it by being a very primal uh, reaction that comes from deep within. I mean, it w wasn't the only thing that's, uh, the thing that was strange and wonderful phenomenon which I'm not the only one to have had, was that, okay, there's Field Marshal with his voice, but I had a lot of the sense of company. In fact, I never, never felt um, lonely on wow. the ice. Alone, yes, but not lonely. There was uh, always a sense of um, company. Sometimes one was more aware of it and I can remember thinking, particularly some moments when, for instance, you'd get maybe wedged between um, a, a gully of ice and Priscilla would have fallen back down and landed on top of you, well and truly stuck, and you're trying to lift her up. And you're thinking, why aren't they giving me a hand? <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, you know, I talked about sort of behaving like an animal, but in a sophisticated way. And I said that because one didn't lower one's standards to an animal behavior. I always minded my manners because of this sense of company. Shackleton's men, I mean, other great, great explorers of the heroic age, they, they too had this sense that it was like Shackleton's men describing when they went over Elephant Island. Um, that the last in the line would always check to see if the guy behind was all right, even if he was the last in the line. There was a sense that there was somebody behind. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. I guess the only thing I can use to make sense of that in my head, having not experienced these crazy conditions in my life, is just that you're always told to trust the voice within. And I haven't heard somebody or like spoken to somebody before who has actually had the opportunity to hear it as clearly as you. But we are all told that we have that voice within that will guide us, that is there for us, that will look after us and that we can trust. And it sounds like you were able to really connect with that voice within so much that they became their own person to you. Um, and I think that's such an incredible it's such an incredible source of comfort. Mm, it is. It is a great sense of comfort and gives you a uh, clarity too and helps sort of propel you on. I mean, I don't think you have much choice but to, if you want to survive, but to listen to that voice. Um, and, and everything else, as I said, is, is cleared out of the way. So you're tuning in much more easily. Certainly, I would defy anyone to leave the ice after a major endeavour as an atheist. Oh, that's so interesting that you say that, because I was wondering if, seeing as you have this deep male voice talking to you, would you define that as the voice of God that just would not let you give up and would not let you die? There was certainly a very strong, bright energy there. And um, I remember one particular moment when, when you're in a dangerous situation or in danger, several things happen. Um, First of all, you, you assess the situation and then you're busy coping with it, doing what you can to survive. So <clears throat> there isn't much space for uh, fear or thinking about anything else. And then sometimes, as happened to me, there's a moment when you've done everything that you can and there's nothing more to be done but wait on your fate and it ain't looking good. And that, that is the most extraordinary, extraordinary moment. And I say moment, because I'm never quite sure how long these times last. 
And there was one particular one, I remember, when I'd done everything I could to get out of the ice um, disturb disturbance around me and breaking up and it was breaking up under my feet and it was breaking up around. There was nowhere to run or hide to. So I had stuffed all my uh, communication and emergency equipment down in front of my flying suit. I'd uh, taken out extra thick mitts um, and I put my little prayer again with some of Jock's pictures on and message from strapped to the top of my sledge. And there was nothing more to be done. And there was this terrific, terrific, horrible noise going on and the ground was shaking. And I just focused, focused on this drawing and prayer, basically. And it just suddenly, everything receded and seemed to go terribly still and and quiet. I in a different way, like I was on a different plane, in a different time capsule. I don't know what it was, but I could almost look down on myself. And everything was fine. It was calm. It was gentle. It was warm. The only the only thing was I felt a slight sadness. I sort of I remember kind of this thought about Jock and William of being a thing of the past. And then it seemed to suddenly come back again, almost like a sort of judder, you know, the ground, all, like a boat coming up against the side of a harbour. And I, I almost sort of like came to and, and the ice sort of like that. And I could see a path out because it wasn't moving anymore. So I just strapped on my harness and belted out, but it was, a very um, memorable moment. And <laughs> some years later, I remember um, I had the uh, good fortune to find myself talking to um, what they call a living Buddha. And um, he said, uh, I was invited to go up and, and, and have a conversation with him. And I sat down and I thought, oh, he's not saying anything. Um, but it's for me to listen to his wisdom, not for me to jabber on what can I say? So I told him about this incident. And he didn't say anything at all. In fact, I'm sure he looked rather, he looked bored. <laughs> anyway, I thought, oh, that didn't go well. And the next day I met him again. And uh, he said to me, that story you told me yesterday, yes. <laughs> said, um, it's not so unusual. Other people have traveled out of their bodies like that. Some people trained to do it for a long time, but you didn't do it for very long. <laughs> he added crushingly. <laughs> but it was fascinating. I'd obviously kind of disembodied. And he said, it's what happens when you prepare for death or you're in that doorway. quite a thought isn't it yes it is quite a thought the, did it occur to you at the time that you felt like you were dying well I didn't think I was going to make it that's for sure goodness me Rosie and so it was a higher power that was looking after you in that moment that went hang on a minute you're not ready yet and put you back inside and gave you yes. a out. Is that the... It's been a mistake, but you go. Yeah. <laughs> or one yanked oneself back. Unfinished business. <laughs> Do you feel it was you that yanked yourself back then because you had that thought of William and Jock? Could have been love, yeah. Gosh, yes. you almost look like you're tearing up, reliving that moment and that memory. Where are yep. the fears coming from? Are they coming from a place of happiness that you did survive that or a place of sadness as, as that you had to go through that, you had to endure it? 
No happiness. Um, there was one thing I never did on the ice, and that was I never, never shed a tear. I never cried, and I, I think that I can remember uh, howling. Maybe that was the way. Because what was the point in in crying? Because there was no one to cry in front of. Maybe, you know. So, <clears throat> yeah, I can remember howling. Howling in in terms of pain, short cry. Pain. No, it was pain. It was a sort of mechanism, a coping mechanism. Is that um, physical pain as you're going through with frostbite or is it emotional pain? Uh, it was a, a, a nasty mixture of physical pain from gangrene and um, anguish that, you know, Again, this this telepathy thing. I, I I felt an irrational frustration that there were two people in particular who are, I know who are healers, um, Orlando Salamanca and Stuart Anderson, and I called out to them in a sort of biblical way, but in anger and frustration, why aren't you doing something to help? You know, because I was in so much pain. Um, but anyway, I resolved it by getting my ski poles and thrashing poor Priscilla and taking it out on her. <laughs> Who are these two people that you mentioned that you were calling out to? Um, Orlando is a friend of old. Uh, he's a Venezuelan artist. And um, I met him in, in Prague. And, and uh, he's a very dear friend. And he's a, he's a great healer and he's very spiritual. and. Um, I just felt that there was a, a cord of contact there. And Stuart Anderson, um, I used to know years ago, did a lot of spiritual healing. So um, things, um, things like communication take on a different dimension um, when you're on and the only person on five million square miles of ice. Um, we had a we had an incident where one member of my support crew was actually quietly emptying um, the expedition bank account and every day withdrawing cash. And the the day that he started doing it, I started thinking about. I wonder if the finances are all right. I mean, I hope I'm not going to come back to debt or anything. It should be okay. Can I still afford that final resupply and things like that? And I've never ever ever thought about. Um, the money side of things when I'm out there doing the job never <laughs> so gosh it's that intuition again isn't it well we all have it over here as well don't you don't you have that thing sometimes when you think of somebody and hey, voila on the doormat in the post is a postcard from them <laughs> oh, goodness me Rosie after experiencing such anguish and pain and near-death experiences why did you put yourself through it again? Because you, you, uh, it gives you the privilege of going out onto the other side and exploring a very different side of existence. And um, I find that very fascinating. I, fi I, fi I find fear and pain rather interesting. And, and um, I mean, it's gold dust for research, of course, as well. Uh, and one of the things we do, back to earth with a big hard bump, is, um, <laughs> you know, as soon as possible, lab rat here goes back into, you know, touch the tarmac back home and you're into the lab for the physiological testing so that you're uh, raw from the expedition and then you're um, re-interviewed and tested uh, several weeks later. Is that why you describe it like gold dust? Is because you're one of only a handful of people who are willing to put themselves through things like this. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, anyone anyone who's been through different types of ordeals, you know, um, you see that the, and it's interesting about the fear, isn't it? Because you know, you must know the feeling, but you're very professional. But that moment when you said earlier, you know, about you 
already beaming up, da, 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 everything is cranking up, your fight, fight or flee instinct is revving up, and then you're on the side of the stage and somebody says, yeah, wait, can you hang on a second? And that's like being at the top of one of those huge ski jumps and your heart is in your mouth with that person. And suddenly the gate doesn't go up and you've got to stand there and we're, oh. <laughs> I mean, there's, I think there's, um, it's like there's uh, adrenaline fear, fight or flight, as we've just described. Then there is um, bowel churning fear, which, I, which is when you, you realize that this is life threatening coming up, anticipation, whatever it is, and you can feel your body, sorry to be blunt, but biologically preparing. <laughs> um, and then there is uh, that other fear, the great fear um, that I described. It's interesting. I think it's interesting. I, I'm finding this incredibly interesting, everything you're saying. I'm, I'm wondering now which kind of fear you had when you got frostbite in your toes on day three of an 84 day expedition and you knew that those toes were not going to finish the mission with you. <laughs> but um, how did that feel? Were you looking at your toes going, they're gonna have to come off? <laughs> those, little, those little piggies are going to market. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie honestly when you um first told me this I felt so embarrassed because um we were having dinner you and William had prepared such a wonderful dinner for Rich and I and we made um a joke about how you obviously came back with all your fingers because Sir Ranulph Fiennes did not um and then you mentioned your toes and I thought oh no I'm just <laughs> I shouldn't have brought it up. I, I couldn't believe that you had to go through something like that. Um, are you happy to tell the toes story? <laughs> Toe the line. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, fun enough to use Le Mot Just, uh, just as you have, when I first discovered uh, that frostbite was kicking in, um, I was embarrassed. <laughs> I think that uh, I could see, ooh, because uh, it could jeopardize the expedition, right? You know, I've only just left the starting box, although the first few days are notoriously difficult on the Arctic. And, um, you know, when you first set off, uh, the, the your greatest fear after all, and what keeps you awake at night before you set foot on the ice is fear of failure. Nobody's frightened of failure, making a fool of yourself. And this was it, day three. And um, frostbite itself isn't so much the problem as when it, it, it gets gangrene infected, which it did and spreads. And um, that's when you have to um, take it seriously um, because and remove the infected parts because otherwise if it spreads and if it gets to your bones you're you're you've had it um and obviously you have limited medical facilities um uh, there you're on your own however i have to say that when i started the solo expedition onto the arctic when i was dropped off and on the same flight there was one other small team made up of two women i knew both an american called Anne bancroft and a wonderful Norwegian lady, wonderful, called Liv Arnison. And um, the comms were buzzing um, because we were trying to, I was trying to communicate with my um, expedition doctor to see what to do to keep going. And he found out that um, Doc Martin, shout out Doc Martin, um, that um, Liv Anderson, the Norwegian, and Anne were in trouble. Um, they too, because they too have been obviously through the same conditions. It was, the temperatures had dropped to the minus sixties without wind chill. And so she had got frostbite in her toes and was calling for an evacuation. Would I like to share the flight out? No, thank you very much. 
I'll do whatever it takes to continue. And they were so uh, funny and nice about it because Liv said, well, you uh, English, you're, you're, you're mad, really. <laughs> um, but I will offer, if you want, we can, we can airdrop some medical supplies to you as, as we're evacuated. Um, and uh, actually I never received, which is often the case of their drops on the Arctic, never received those supplies. But um, so I, I managed under, you know, my expedition doctor told me how to remove um, the problem areas. And I sterilized my Leatherman over the stove and talked again out loud. I pretended this is more of a obviously role playing very obviously I pretended to be a confident surgeon instructing out loud and because by doing that I could disembody myself totally and uh, it makes me squeamish to talk about it now in this reality but at the time you have to do um, what is necessary and because of necessity is, a, is, a, is the anaesthetic. The problem was um, that it's not the frostbite that hurts, it's the gangrene and after the um, amputations, it was anything around and on that area, the pressure, boots. Um, I had to make a, a frame to prop up the sleeping bag, um, for instance, so there was no pressure on it at night, it was too painful. And so there we go, and on I went. It did mean, it did mean certain things like I found that uh, I could walk on snowshoes and skis okay, but when it came to maybe trudging around um, making camp or breaking camp, I couldn't trudge around. I had to do it all on my knees. So that's an awful long time to, uh, because it was just too painful, the stopping starting. So uh, that was that was difficult. Gosh, that sounds more than difficult. I understand why you're talking about it in such a matter of fact way. I feel like you'd have to approach it in that way to be able to face it. Yes, you're right. Yeah. And I can also understand how it makes you feel squeamish talking about it now. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me, but what does what does frostbite and gangrene feel like? What and how does that feel when it's in your toes and you know it's going to spread? What's that feeling? Frostbite, you don't actually feel at all. It's not, it's not painful. I, I, oh. It's very different when you've got uh, the beginnings of uh, cold-related injuries in your fingers or your, your toes and you have to get the blood back in. That's extremely painful. Um, um, and you have to be very careful how you do that as well. But anyway, that, I won't go into that now. Um, but uh, what happens is that obviously you've damaged all the uh, blood vessels, uh, capillaries, veins and everything. And, and so they become very fragile and they become infected. And the, it also changes. It's, it's like you look as if you're very bruised and they swell. So you turn, uh, or the, the area turns various shades of aubergine <laughs> and, and, then, and then swells up. Uh, with liquid and then I, I can remember the, the, the precise moment when I felt something in my boot <laughs> and thought oh no you know um, we're on to a different stage here and that was the, the moment must have been about the third fourth day when it actually it all popped and broke and, and you know all went wrong basically so yes so um, then you have to uh, clean it, get rid of the, the rotting stuff and, um, and uh, take antibiotics. Unfortunately, I had antibiotics, but um, I ran out of antibiotics. I ran out of clean bandaging too after um, a week, I think it was. So that, that was another challenge. <laughs> I'm sure it was. What what did you do when you ran out of antibiotics and, and bandages? What did you have clothes that you could put around it? Because I imagine all the clothes you had were you, you were using. You just vulture. 
uh, anything that you can uh, that is as clean as possible. So mostly my, you know, cutting great chunks of things out of spare layers or whatever it is um, and trying to keep it clean and dry. Um, and one course of antibiotics had, had done very well, actually. Yeah. Wow. Because that was going to be my next question was, you know, you've got this gangrene that you have to stop, but how do you stop it getting infected after you've removed the toe? How do you stop it getting worse from that point? And only one course of antibiotics that was able to stay you the whole of the 84 days. Yes. Gosh. Yeah. That's amazing. See, as long as you keep it absolutely clean, I guess um that uh there there isn't <laughs> there isn't much bacteria out there <laughs> that helps <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm sure it does but you said the toe had already burst anyways was that inside your boot because then you've got all that bacteria inside your boot yes i guess so yeah but um you're not wearing the same socks um i can't remember what i think i cut off the top of those socks actually to help make bandaging but um you just have to make do with what you've got in the circumstances. But that's incredible, your determination to carry on. Did you know how many days you had in front of you and you were going to do it with amputated toes and wounds that needed such care, trudging through day after day after day and not stopping? I mean, when you're trudging through ice, your whole body's important, but I imagine your toes being on your feet, quite important to <laughs> <those. laughs> Well, actually, so, it's more important. That's what I'd originally been really paranoid about. <laughs> what was more important? Hands. hands. If, if your hands um, lose the ability to, to function, you're dead on the ice because on your own, because you can't get the tent up. You can't get your stove lit, uh, which is key. Um, even if you can um, somehow operate uh, um, your communications and your emergency communications, and even if you press that red button emergency, you cannot guarantee that the cavalry will come charging over the hill because of the um, conditions. They have a very long way to come. And uh, they, you know, if you're so far up across the ice towards the pole they will have to stop somewhere to refuel um you know a bit about flying now if it's a twin otter it means two twin otters have to go because one has to fuel the other and um if it's a helicopter they only have a couple in that at that end of canada nunavut uh, has to come an incredibly long way and that is really classified as emergency rescue operation because you know, you're potentially depriving other Canadians of access to an emergency helicopter. <laughs> so you've got to think of that as well. Goodness me. And yet you had that incredible dogged determination to carry on all those days. All Might those have. days. Well, I didn't know <laughs> that it was going to take that long. <laughs> well, I thought that you was really quick. I reckoned at the outside 75 days and after that I'd be uh, chancing it in the, the, the race against time before the ice melted in the spring thaw. Goodness me, I'm going to check now because I've got all my, I've had to have so many notes talking to you because there are so many incredible things to talk about, but goodness me, 84 days, that was a world record, a record breaking expedition which had never before nor since been bettered. Hmm. That is completely incredible. What was the amount of days that it was before your record breaking trip? I don't know, actually. Um, genuinely don't know. Yeah, um, so you were alone for 84 days, setting another world record as the longest and furthest solo expedition to the North Pole by any woman. Yes. That's incredible. I think most of the women I'm aware of who have, uh, that I definitely know, have tried, Mm. uh have been on the ice for i think i think the longest was just over two weeks maybe three and um certainly i don't think any of them got much further than 100 nautical miles that's vastly different yeah 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, everybody has a different challenge thrown at them. Mm. So, you know, uh, the things that you always worry about before you set off are never what transpires to be your <laughs> major obstacle threat or whatever. It's, it's something completely different. What have you worried about for, before that's never materialised then? Uh, I wasn't worried about anything particularly physical, actually. I'll go back to that point that I think that I was frightened of um, not being capable of something. I mean, I was frightened that I'd do something daft, like let my tent um, blow away in a storm or set fire to it or, <laughs> you know, these things happen. <laughs> you know, uh, fear of failure. Uh, so much from so many people had gone into this expedition. It wasn't just my face and failure. It was the weight of the responsibility in my sledge of, of family, but friends, but supporters and sponsors, my team, my backup team who worked so hard to make it all come together to, you know, it's, uh, it's quite a heavy burden to carry. I believe you. When you talk about your backup team, how many people there help you plan the expedition and put it together? How many people are there as your backup? Oh, uh, a, a good little handful. I had uh, an amazing um, admin assistant and friend called Shah Harrison. I had a, who I always have this whiz on logistics and, and management called Steve Jones, Jonesy. I had a uh, the world's leading uh, polar photographer Martin Hartley who's seen so many ice miles um, that is actually far more proficient than I am on ice. <laughs> Take a look at his work everybody Martin Hartley amazing and um, I'm gonna write that down we'll have to put his name in the description so that people can find him Martin he, Hartley. Martin Hartley. In the description cool. Yes and Steve Jones. Steve Jones. Also in the description. Also, I had two brilliant trainers who were completely different. Um, I had Alan Pearson, ex-army, very clever, very clever trainer, great. And uh, he just, it was very bespoke and uh, uh, Rich will understand about this, specific training programmes. And, uh, and then I had an ex-para who was just really tough, brutal, um, called Lee Watts, who I still train with, actually. <laughs> Wonderful. And I've, I've seen some of your training gear in your expedition shed, and it's quite amazing the amount of different tyres you've got that you drag through woods <laughs> and various other things. And I think I've seen pictures of you tipping over a massive tire that must be like three times your weight oh I'm pulling a car I've seen you with a yeah. harness on pulling a car <laughs> couldn't afford the petrol <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible uh -huh. because as you've said you're a petite woman you're five foot three and yet you are so much strength you've got that you're able to pull these tires and pull the car that's just such amazing training for Priscilla. Um, but what other training do you do to prepare for these expeditions? Well, uh, you have to, first of all, you have to apply yourself. You know what it's like, Mary Jess. You just don't go out there and sing. You know, there's a, to make it look silky seamless is the way that you do. Um, you put a lot of, a lot of, of hard work in. And um, for my, particular uh, career path, <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm physically not cut out for it. So maybe I have to train harder than um, other people. Um, but also because it's not all about uh, physical strength and it isn't more about the mental strength, the physical strength helps bring out um, and underpins your mental strength. You feel more confident. And maybe that's why I, I train so hard because I want to be more than prepared for anything because I know that particularly when it was the polar expeditions, I know it's going to be worse than one can imagine. Um, so you feel ready 
for that and everything about you like like you sort of visualize that spider woman thing like, like mesh all over you you are ready through and through and through holographically head heart <laughs> um it's it's very important and uh you know i'm still training relatively hard um not so hard as that not so hard that butts and balls start flying off um but so that I'm ready, coiled for action. I can go anywhere, anytime, drop of a hat. I'm ready. <laughs> Absolutely. I think a lot of us feel like that as we're hopefully coming out of lockdown soon. Just ready to get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, picking at the starting box. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Although your plans, I imagine, um, are far more... <sighs> in need of preparation. I know you're planning some incredible expeditions when we are able to get out of the starting blocks. So could you tell us more about your plans for the future in terms of your future expeditions? Well, uh, very briefly, I think I've done one that I think we talked about, which was the Siberian frozen lake, Lake Baikal. I, I've done that. And yes. uh, then uh, the next, uh, which was postponed from last year because of guess what, um, is a new desert, uh, environmental, one of the worst environmental disasters in the world, because it's man-made, uh, uh, crossing the Aral Kum. Uh, the Aral was a sea in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and it's now, it's now a desert, because it was drained to um, feed um, water to the cotton crops. Um, to satisfy the demands of fast fashion, basically. So uh, the fallout effect is incredible. It's not just that it's now a desert, not a sea, um, but obviously the impact on uh, wildlife, fauna, flora, but, and, and the communities, the fishing community, you know, gone. Most of it's gone. Um, they've tried to reintroduce uh reintroduce more water back into the few puddles that remain um but it's very difficult because the whole ecology has changed now and it's very high salinity it's highly toxic uh the climate's changed because there's so lots of dust storms which carry all the toxicity um there's a high mortality rate with infants i mean you know i, I it's a whole other talk what's going on on the arrow come that being said, our expedition is not about being critical and wagging our fingers because a, a lot of people are trying their best. Kazakhstan itself, you know, building a dam, uh, trying to introduce uh, uh, buffers to the, the storms around the desert, uh, new fish breeds, um, not that they're surviving. Um, so it's to cross it and as we cross it, uh, we'll be crossing symbolically like the, all the different decades of when the water was receding, rather like the uh, trunk of a tree, and you get those rings which demark its age. There are decades of years when you can see how far the water receded as uh, the Russians um, pulled the plug and it receded the coastline further and further until in the 90s, they started in the 60s, actually they started surreptitiously in the 50s, and then they thought no one's watching, just pull the plug in the 60s. And by the 90s, um, there was only 10% of the sea left. That's devastating, completely devastating. And I, I know that we both share a love of, fa of slow fashion, <laughs> to use that yeah. term. We, um, both of us don't buy any fast fashion anymore and it is, it is because of so many reasons, water usage and water abuse being one of those reasons. Um, a lot of my supporters will know that I haven't bought fast fashion for a good couple of years now since I found out about this. And I now have my own slow fashion store to try and encourage buying oh. sustainably. Um, so this is something that is very close to my heart that you're talking about here. The amount of research that you'll be able to do on that expedition will surely be able to help with proving to people just how damaging this is. What kind of research are you hoping to do and what kind of things are you hoping that you'll be able to find? 
Um, well, we'll be doing our usual uh, research on the impact on us physically and, and psychologically. What will be interesting on that is how the environment impacts on us as well, because it's toxic. We'll have to take proper uh, grown-up masks, for instance, um, and talking to um, the communities as much as we can. Uh, we have to understand that they might not be able to be totally open in their opinions and um, and also just uh, observing uh, the impact on the environment itself you know what what's happening to the shoreline um, what are the fishermen catching um, you know, all these, all these little things and see how successful maybe some of these measures are that have been taken to try and stem the, um, the impact of the draining. I think that when one does these expeditions, you set out to discover, you don't necessarily know what you're going to discover until you're there. Do you tend to plan your expeditions based on things that are close to your heart? Because going from polar expeditions and so much ice and cold to a desert, that's quite a huge difference. So did you pick this because you're interested in looking at the water abuse? Is it something that you followed your heart? Or did you think, first of all, I've done a lot of icy things now, let's go somewhere a bit warmer. Was that the other <laughs> part of it? Uh, I've always thought that on every polar expedition. Why am I doing this again? Why can't I find a hot desert to cross? <laughs> it will be next time. Well, anyway, so we're doing the, the Aral come in, in August, myself and teammate Pom Oliver, who's another ex-polar bird. And um, no, well, one mustn't forget that um, the Arctic and Antarctica are both deserts as well, um, by scientific definition. Um, they're just frozen. Um, deserts uh, and so this is this is a um, <laughs> muddy <laughs> as well as sandy gritty salty desert so it is certainly the there is an allure to the desolation that accompanies um, deserts um, and I think it's um, it is uh, interesting not good news but interesting that the challenges, the major challenges we face are of a very modern nature in that it is the toxicity, it's the pollution, it's, it's politics to a degree as well. We have to be a little bit careful there. Um, we go, or we bounce at one point off the nose of what used to be an island in this sea called Vosrozdenaya Island. Now, interesting place. During the Cold War, uh, that's where the Russians had their playground for experimenting with biological warfare. So anything from anthrax to bubonic plague, um, you name it, smallpox, it's, it was all played around with there. Uh, and there was still trace of it. The Americans came in in around about 2000, 2001 and decontaminated it, but I'm not quite sure <laughs> how thorough um, anybody's decontamination might be when it's gone that deep for that long. So we have to be very careful of all that sort of thing, but it's something that also will be very interested to see what the, you know, what the role is that that plays in the great picture of the Aral disaster. Is that actually safe for people to go there? It doesn't sound it, Rosie. No, don't even choose. Um, Why are you going? <laughs> Why are you going? <laughs> As somebody who cares for you dearly and loves you very, very much. Why are you going? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, somebody has to do the front line stuff. And so, brave. Uh, so much information is reliant on internet, second, third, blah, 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 hand information, that uh, when you go out in the field to look at these uh, places, areas, scenes yours, oneself in person, there's every chance that you discover something different or new and hopefully of value, of import. And that's, that's part of the 
expedition legacy. And I'm sure you've heard me banging on before about um, adventure is all very well and great fun, but, but it's a tick box thing. Whereas the difference with genuine endeavor and expedition is that it is sim symbiotic with a legacy of learning that is sharing your discovery with as many people in, in as many different ways as is possible. And hopefully, whether it's uh, motivating, inspiring or illuminating to those people, it doesn't matter, but as long as it has some lasting efficacy. And that's why it's so important to you to do so many experiments during your expeditions then? Yes, yes. crucial part of it. I can imagine you going out to this desert being dressed like an astronaut <laughs> in the, the full <laughs> biomed stuff. Uh, yeah. I know. Well, actually, before we were about to set off, when we were supposed to have set off uh, last year, whatever it was, I'd sort of got most of the kit and everything together. And one of the areas that I thought, well, no, we'll get that and we'll get that lastminute.com was masks. We just started sort of researching. Them. And then, of course, I couldn't get any for love of money. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. But I imagine the masks that you will need will be... I mean, I'm imagining like a gas mask. Oh, yeah. We, we, well, exactly. And actually, we had started looking for those. And as the um, COVID hove more into view and became much more of a reality, and, and we had anyway been scurrying around uh, at military sources, for instance, um, there was that sort of uncomfortable feeling. There was a whiff of sort of like, what's going on here? Because they all down, shut us down. No. Nope. I haven't got any, so you must have some for your military training and defence. You know, even in the right up there. No. Gosh, so they could probably see the pandemic coming before we could. Yes, exactly. Goodness me. I mean, thank goodness you didn't set off. I mean, if you'd have set off and been out there while the pandemic was yeah. starting and raging, like, would anybody have been able to have come and got you at the end of it? I don't know. One can only hope that it will happen this year. Goodness me, you're hoping to go in August? Yes. Wow. Well, I, I really hope, Rosie, that you're able to <laughs> complete this um, and do all that incredible research uh, that you have planned. Um, and goodness me, please stay safe because I'll worry about you. <laughs> I have to come back for one of your concerts, so. Eh? <laughs> You see, the, the avid trainer, fitness freak, is drinking her super unhealthy <laughs> dark coke. <laughs> well, you're at home now. I'm sure you're allowed to be a bit of downtime before you ramp it up again, ready for the next one. Absolutely. Life's too short not to have a donut every now and then. So. <laughs> oh, my gosh, Rosie, talking about donuts. Um, there is a place down the road from us. Yes. They've started making fresh donuts every morning. Oh, no. Honestly, Rosie. Really? <laughs> because freshly made are so different. They are freshly you. made every morning. So you've got to go there in the morning because they sell out as well. Um, okay. They've got salted caramel ones, cream and jam ones. Around Halloween, they had a pumpkin spice one. Um, they have a coffee one that they, do. oh gosh, there's oh. so many. Oh my God. Honestly. Okay, I know what I'm bringing to you as a thank you next time we get yes. together. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Ah, oh, exactly a donut i this completely is, agree with you no good i'm and this is no good we can't continue i'm drooling like alien <laughs> you're definitely a woman after my own heart there honestly my sweet tooth but my uh, mouth is full of sweet tooth cake i love cake yeah me too <laughs> oh my gosh it must be the one perk of being out on the ice doing an expedition is that you can eat as much chocolate and cake as you want because you've got to get those calories into you. <laughs> yeah, well, before and after, because you can't have it on the ice, but I did fantasise about it a lot. And um, yeah, no, I mean, like Top Cat when you get back. <laughs> is that the one thing you look forward to when you get back, is a nice slice of cake? Oh, <laughs> cake. When, when, I, when I was uh, plucked off the, the south, it was... Um, very clear in my mind I want a big plate of liver and spinach and mashed potato and that's because of course my iron levels were I mean I was six stone two or something 
I came off the ice. Holy moly! Six and stone the... two, Rosie. Yeah. Oh my goodness me! I can't imagine that. I'm eight stone, just over eight stone um, myself. Six stone. Oh, goodness and me. And you're petite, très petite. Like you? Yeah. No, not but not quite as much as you, but <laughs> especially not after <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> but oh my gosh six that, that's crazy but yeah liver makes sense I was um anemic growing up so before I was a vegetarian I would claim uh crave liver yeah really? for my anemia yeah so what do you do about that now do you eat lots of broccoli oh no, thankfully it's sorted now I'm glad to say <laughs> <laughs> but um I do yeah I do do other things um and eat other things and have, sometimes have supplements um yeah. to make sure but yeah I can imagine you'd crave all kinds of things because your body knows what it needs doesn't it it does it does it's a finely tuned machine particularly if you use your body as a vehicle like you're singing uh you know what's what's good for for that energy and you probably know also you know what's good for your vocals and it's it's much like when you're in training for something as rich would know you, you, you become super sensitive um like um the terminator to anything that's not you know quite right <laughs> you turn into a hypochondriac basically <laughs> <laughs> talking of the terminator isn't that part of your nickname yes yeah <laughs> yeah and it's a very apt nickname, I must say. Tinkerbell the Terminator. Yes. <laughs> Who gave you that? I don't, it, it was, I was referred to as that uh, when I came back from an expedition um, when we were living in Prague and it stuck. <laughs> it went pandemic, <laughs> so to speak. So uh, there you go, this, you know, the horse has bolted. <laughs> Goodness me, it's such a great, such a great name for you. I, like, I thought it was brilliant. As soon as you sent it over in the notes, I was like, that is fantastic. But you didn't just live in Prague, did you? You lived in China as well. Yes, we lived in Shanghai, which was a, a wonderful contrast. But I, I did really love living in Prague. And we were there for about over six years. Wow. And China um i think my husband william had a greater affinity with with china i enjoyed the experience but when i left and came back to england um i didn't miss it at all wow i see i do miss it no but i just oh i loved it i loved it and i was like the food <laughs> i did like the food <laughs> it was good, wasn't it? the food but you mentioned your husband william um now you said that he's got some polar experience yes is that, which yes has, um any other couple the other one might have said you're certainly not traipsing off on polar expeditions but <laughs> william was always very supportive and he his family was um uh well his grandfather was a rail explorer in the sense that he was out there with shackleton uh, he was on the Transantarctic 1914 expedition. Wow. Uh, he did a lot of his own stuff, both up in the north and in the south. So he belonged to the era of uh, heroic exploration. And um, he was president of the RGS. Uh, he was a don at Cambridge. He was quite a, quite a character. Wow. He was a James Wordy. And he was Shackleton's... Um, chief geologist and scientist. Gosh, that's incredible. Has William <laughs> caught that bug then? Has he ever said, Rosie, let me come with you? <laughs> <laughs> he's very sweet. He says he's an armchair explorer and he's very oh. happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine the worry that he has for you when you go away. How often are you able to communicate with him when you're on the ice? Yeah, it's very tough. Um, it's very tough to be the one who's left behind worrying um although i think that everyone uh parties him quite well <laughs> to keep him distracted um but it, it must be difficult for him and i tell you what i always think must be sorely trying is that when one comes back and for years afterwards people will want to know and talk to me all the time and he's heard it all before <clears throat> has to listen to it all the time which is 
boring old fart going on again. About <laughs> he never, he's never complained. I'm sure he doesn't feel like that. He's such a lovely, lovely man. He's really, really wonderful. Um, and such a great cook as well. I imagine you'd look forward to his cooking. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, sort of, it's all the wrong way around, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, wrong way around in terms of what? <laughs> well, he's the one with the real polar background. He should be out there. <laughs> and crusades maybe and I should be doing culinary crusades but I, I, I'm a disaster in the kitchen I think he, he might be a disaster on the ice <laughs> <laughs> oh dear well Rosie I've got some quick fire questions for you if you wouldn't yeah. mind indulging me in some of these questions um so I'm wondering what's the best wildlife experience that you've had while you've been out on an expedition Very interesting that because you don't see any wildlife on the interior of Antarctica because nothing can survive there. All the wildlife is around its petticoats uh, where the ice meets the sea. On the Arctic, I think one of the most memorable um, meetings I had with, again, the limited wildlife there um, because it's what you get polar bears, you don't really want to <laughs> have too many encounters with them, but was um, also with Arctic foxes. I saw an Arctic fox on one occasion, and that was very worrying because they're symbiotic with bears. But one memorable one was coming up against a huge area of open water in the ice, and up popped in the middle of it, this head of, uh, a ring of seal and it went round like a periscope and then froze because it saw me and we were both there sort of thinking what the heck <laughs> and um, and then again I, I, I moved off quite quickly because um, where there's a seal there might be a bear watching as well so you know but the, in polar context very limited because there is very little that's actually visible on, on the ice. Yeah, that makes sense. I just remembered her reading about one of your expeditions that I've got here, um, <clears throat> about you spending time with the Inuit community um, yeah. and that there were polar bears around while you were doing that expedition with them. Yes, there were. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the tracks on the ice were, 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 was like a sort of Piccadilly at, circus at Russia and um, when I arrived and, uh, and met with uh, Billy, our man, the Inuit, and stayed with his family in their little house, he said uh, lots of bears, bear country, uh, and I said that's all right, I've got firearms, I had an old Winchester, and he looked at the gun and he looked at me <laughs> was something that was close to despair and uh, said you take Kimmick and I said what's what's a Kimmick and he said Kimmick is my dog um, they they scare bears and they do bears are terrified of dogs um, so and I discovered that Kimmick uh, this dog's name translates from Inukituk to English as dog <laughs> <laughs> anyway, poor Billy. He lent me and photographer Martin Hartley, who came with me to film and photograph on that occasion, uh, Kimmick, as a very wild um, Inuit dog. And Billy said, no need to look after him, just a bag of food every day. That's it. He'll be fine. And uh, over the days on the ice, Kimmick became a bit of a friend. Uh, in fact, I realized Martin had developed a very hungry look about him and he'd been given Kimmick all his rations. And then we built Kimmick an ice kennel. And eventually Kimmick came into the tent every night, got lots of cuddles, tidbits. And by the time we returned, not only was he much fatter, but he was all soft and domesticated and yeah. not food. But he was an incredibly intuitive and good guard dog because uh, 
he seemed to sense when we were going to make camp and were, were looking for something, he would do a huge great circle, basically mark, mark his scent around the ice to ward off bears. And if bears came near, which they did, particularly one night I remember, he, he'd bark and howl. So I don't think I've ever slept so well on the ice, actually. It was a very good idea, taking a dog. Wow. Sounds like um, Brian Blessed could have done with a dog. I remember his story about how a polar bear came into his tent and he had to go, Whoa! and punch it in the face. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't need to punch the bear. You think of Brian Blessed's voice. All he needs to do is go, Whoa! And I mean, <laughs> the, the bear would be blown halfway across the ice, I should think. Would. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah no I can't imagine oh my goodness having to do that I can imagine you'd do it pretty well with your amazing strength that you've got but thank well, you actually, with the dog you'd be very handy because the Inuits <laughs> told me when I said okay uh what, what do you do best defense against a bear without firearms you're on their territory respect you know and maybe more to the point the rifle might have frozen and jammed or whatever and they said, well, first of all, uh, make yourself look as tall as possible. <laughs> That's quite really difficult for us, isn't it? <laughs> not help me. And yes, exactly. Well, you get your skis and you're... But they said also uh, to make a noise uh, that they're not used to. It's no good the rifle shot, uh, for instance, because it sounds like ice snapping, breaking. But sing, do anything. Sing is, is, is very effective. So, <laughs> oh, okay, I'll come and be your icy explorer songbird. That would be fine. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <Don't do> that. <laughs> Gosh, that's so interesting. Uh, did you ever sing to a polar bear then, or was the dog doing quite a good job of that himself? Well, very early on on the um, North expedition, uh, when, as I had mentioned, that this other team of Liv and and the American and Bancroft had was so nice they sort of quite arranged and they let me set off to give me my space to be solo ahead of them i mean what you must understand is in in the ice and in the rubble within hours you are completely lost from another group anyway but i was allowed to go ahead do my own thing for you know a day or whatever and that night i heard all sorts of uh, strange noises and being a bit jumpy new girl on the ice i started banging saucepans together and eventually started singing at the top of my voice and i realized i didn't think there was really a bear there at all and what if the wind had carried my voice and my rantings back down to the other team <laughs> it's very embarrassing in a british way <laughs> So when you were planning your solo trips, were you aware of anybody else that was trying to beat you to it on the solo expeditions? Oh, good question. Yes. Um, when it came to the south, I was. Uh, not the north, but the south. And I remember looking in horror at this television screen, um, it was Sky News or something, and uh, there was this tall athletic very strong looking woman who said she was going solo to the south pole and um she was british too i was absolutely horrified and <laughs> i expect she was horrified to learn about me too and then we we kind of we we didn't confer with each other at all stayed parallel aware of each other ended up in punta arenas at the same time still didn't really cross paths um but there was something developing i think it was a sort of must be a kindred spirit type feeling and um i remember as i went across antarctica keeping an eye out for her um she had um she had set ahead because i <laughs> with british laissez-faire i had agreed to have a cup of tea with uh quite a well-known polar explorer, Pen Haddo, at, at the ice strip um, before setting off. So I, I hung around for 24 hours partying, basically. Anyway, she went off and then I followed. And um, so she actually, she got to the pole before me. And uh, I remember at the time, um, it was, was it 23 hours, I think, before I arrived, getting a call 
in the middle of a marching day, a blip blip on my tracker for my base camp manager in England to call urgent. So I called him and he said, look, uh, you, I must let you know to be aware that Fiona Thornwell has just reached the pole. And I could barely walk another step. Those last 23 hours were possibly the most physically grueling in any polar expedition I've done. It was how Scott must have felt after getting to South Pole and seeing that he'd been picked to the post. I can't imagine how he would have ever made it back because um, I was crestfallen at the time. Fiona was so nice and, and so sweet. And we sat together in our, shared our tents and looked after each other while we waited to be flown back. And we stayed in touch. And, um, you know, she, she told me that uh, she had actually waited before getting to the finishing line a bit to see if she could see me, to see if I was going to get in, we could arrive together. I mean, she's, she, uh, interestingly, she's a very Christian um, woman and she was just very thoroughly decent. And um, so there we have it. The challenges always come from a direction you don't expect, as I said. Wow. Has she ever done the, the North Pole as well? Because you were the first woman who did the North and the South Pole, weren't you? She didn't do the North Pole, no. Um, I think she went on to do some guiding in, um, I don't think she ever went back to the polar region, but I think she's done some stuff in Norway, etc. cetera. Wow. So, uh, and remember that strictly speaking, um, I didn't touch 90 degrees north. Uh, I fell short by a degree. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what I learned from, from both of those, what really did learn. It took a while, but it is about the journey. And actually it's a selfish thing to dwell on not being the first to get to that South Pole as a British woman, um, for instance, because people are actually not interested in that. What they're interested in is, is knowing and sharing what you learned and discovered. That's I true. Hope. <laughs> That's completely true. I mean, look at what I'm interested in, in now. I'm just so grateful that you've been so generous with your time that, that I've been able to ask you about your experiences and you've shared so many of your stories. That's what I have cared about. That's what I've found so gripping throughout all of this is hearing your stories. It's not yes. the, the end goal, even though that's so cool and amazing. <laughs> it's the stories that I've just found riveting. Yes. See, Shackleton, um, Shackleton never made it to a pole. He failed twice to the South Pole, but for such noble reasons. And Scott didn't make it back. Um, Henry Worsley is a more contemporary heroic figure who died in his attempt to do Transantarctica. But all these people are, are icons of, of uh, valor and perseverance. Mm. All these people, they must have inspired you so much. Is there, is there an, an expedition that somebody else has done where you thought, I'd, I'd love to have been part of that? Um, there is one person in particular I have huge respect for. I'd, I'd never think I'd like to be part of that because he's got the same thing as me about the joy of solo and intensifying an experience. I suspect, and that's a Norwegian man um, called Borga Ausland. Uh, and he, otherwise known as Bergi, and um, he's sort of ex-Norwegian special forces, whatever, but there's something that, you know, with all those elite forces, a gentle strength about him. And he quietly goes off and sets the benchmark on all these polar expeditions. There's never any vainglorious trumpeting or anything like that. He's really quite remarkable. I wow. hate the glory merchants. I loathe the people who go, I've been to the South Pole, I've been to the North Pole. And actually they did a, you know, last degree, they went 60 odd miles or they, they went with a guide and they don't mention the guide and this, that, the other. I 
hate those people. Because I undermine the endeavours of people like Bulga Ausland, who are quite remarkable. And they're undermining the endeavours of their guide if they don't mention the guide. Like the guide was there with them. So often the case. That's such a shame. I I can understand your frustrations with (laughs) with those types of people. Oh my gosh, Rosie. Um, Are you ready for another question? Yes. (laughs) Okay. I know you also really wanted to talk about your charity. Can you tell us more about that? I would love to talk about my charity. It's, It's called Veterans Aid. And um, it evolves uh, around helping ex-servicemen and women um, who have found themselves in desperate situations. And specifically, it's trying to cope with all the elements that go towards the crisis that they find themselves in. So it's not just about taking them in and giving them shelter, um, but it's, it's also about um, healing them from whatever they might have gone through. So whether it's psychological healing, whether it's addiction healing um, and preparing them, almost like re-educating them to go back um, slightly more empowered into uh, the civilian world. And they help them even find job opportunities, sometimes even jobs, help them find housing, sometimes try and help provide that housing. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable charity because it's also terribly well steered and run by um, Hugh Milroy. So although it's small, it's effective. They, they have a 90% success rate, i.e. only 10% of all these people ever, ever come back. And in fact, it's used as a case study and its structure is replicated all over the world in other similar charitable concerns. And the reason why I embraced it is because of the affinity with the, um, the isolation and the pain and the fear of the unknown ahead and that sense of vulnerability um, that so many of them have and are traumatized by. Gosh, Rosie, that's amazing. You're gonna have to give us the links so that I can put them in the description below so that everybody will know how we can support Veterans Aid. Such amazing work you do with them. Thank you, thank you very much. So, I just want to say thank you so much for being so incredibly generous with your time. There are a couple more things that I just really, really want to ask you about um, before I let you go and have a nice cup of tea and a cake. (laughs) Um, And the first one is that when you sent the information over for this um, podcast, it said something that we have in common that I didn't realise. You are part of the Great Britain campaign. You're an ambassador for the Great Britain campaign in 144 countries. Um, And that's just so amazing that you're part of that. And of course you are. So um, I was invited by Downing Street to represent music. And so I want to ask you more about what you were invited to represent, how they asked you and how you're part of that campaign. Oh, well, (laughs) I really haven't done anything for it. I, I too went to Downing Street and there was a, um, a whole uh, crowd of us uh, fr- led by, uh, chaired by Hempelman Adams. And there were people like, you know, Brian Blessed there. <laughs> and I Ke- love him. <laughs> <laughs> um, mountaineers and expeditioners and explorers, etc. cetera. And uh, so it was all about encouraging Um, something that is happening so much more now, uh, which is the um, importance and enjoyment of exploring your own countryside, what's in your own backyard. You don't have to go so far. We live in a beautiful country and a very diverse country when it comes to seeking out adventure and expeditions as well. That's amazing, Rosie, and huge congratulations um, for being part of the campaign, because I know that um, it's just such a wonderful team to be a part of. Um, But the last question that I'd like to ask you before I let you go, (laughs) um, 
and I'd just like to say thank you again as well for sharing so many of your incredible stories, so many of your lessons that you've learned and so much of your time with us. Now you have given us so many incredible bits of inspiration, so many bits, so many lessons, like you said, not focusing on that first, on that all of the horizon, but just on that first wall. You just do it bit at a time. And I love that. Are there is there another lesson that you would like to leave us with that you have learned through your expeditions that you feel everybody can benefit from? Yes. I think that it's very important not to be uh, fearful of failure. It, it's the devil's own stumbling block to achieving in your life and it is very important to leave your imprint in life in whatever walk of life you choose to go and there will be obstacles you will fall you will bruise yourself and scrape yourself get up and keep going and believe in yourself because you'll always be surprised at what you're capable of when you really go for it goodness me I feel so inspired right now. <laughs> I, do. I, think I'll, I think I'll take singing lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it would be an honour to give you singing lessons. Goodness me, it would be an honour. Rosie, thank you so much for spending thank so you, much Rose. of your time with us. I am just so grateful for your openness, your honesty, all your stories. They are just incredible and so inspiring. So Thank you so much for coming and sharing so much of your time. I am so grateful for your generosity. And I can't wait to see you again in person when we're allowed to finally do that. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, Jess, for all your time and your insightful questions and comments as well. Bless you. Gosh, Rosie, you're so interesting. Thank you so much again. I am so grateful for you. And I can't wait to be able to share a cake and a donut with you very soon. <laughs> We're on. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Rosie. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>